Over the years, I've dealt mainly with cultivated plants. That's plants that are propagated and sold in garden centers, other retailers by the hundreds, if not thousands. But there's a whole other world out there if you get out and explore of native and wild plants that aren't commonly sold in garden centers. My goal over the next year is to find at least 50 plants I'm going to photograph, identify, and share with you. Our first plant is lead plant, Amorpha canensis. This has got a nice purple spiky type flower with those yellow anthers. It blooms mid-June through July, gets about one to three feet, and I think the size range probably depends a lot on just the moisture that it gets. Another common name is prairie shoestring, and that taproot can get four feet deep, and that's what keeps some of these prairie plants going, is they can tap moisture even in long, prolonged drought years. It's common in open woodlands, glades, prairies, a wide range of soils, and sometimes it's called false indigo because it's got a resemblance to that plant if you're familiar with it. Lead plant refers to a once held belief that there was lead in the soil, but that no longer is believed to be true. It's great for naturalizing birds, butterflies, bees. One of the characteristics that I was not aware of is that it's a shrub, not a perennial. And let's take a quick look at what that means. Herbaceous is what we're mostly going to look at today and a herbaceous perennial is something where the tissue above ground dies back each season or if you live in a more temperate climate after it's done flowering that tissue will tend to start dying back compared to woody now this lead plant we're talking about is a woody plant and they create secondary wood or wood that we're familiar with so it's going to survive the winter and it's going to re-emerge from the buds, the above ground portion. So that's the main difference between herbaceous and woody. Our next plant, showy milkweed. Now milkweed, we're going to look at a little bit about the importance of butterflies with this plant, but this is a nice plant that shows up all over the place, self-seeds itself, has a rhizome. Look at that purplish flower, that's kind of unique. That's a close up there. It's got a long bloom period all the way June through August can have a wide range in height again between one and a half to three and a half feet. It gets its name milkweed because of that milky sap in the stem. It can be very toxic to wildlife and wildlife tend to stay away from it. And it's interesting as we take a look here going forward that the butterflies, when the eggs that they lay on it hatch, the larva, they eat that foliage and birds will not tend to eat those larva. They're also not attracted to it because of the poisonous qualities of that foliage. Now, monarch butterflies, as we mentioned, do rely on the milkweed as they migrate from Mexico all the way up into the northern states. So they lay their eggs as they fly along. Those larvae or worm stage hatch, feed on the foliage, and it completes its life cycle in that way. The milkweed also attracts hummingbirds, bumblebees, and honeybees. That orange flower that we've got down there with the butterfly, that's in the same genus as this showy milkweed that we're looking at, the Asclepius genus. We've got a quick video here we can look at, and I'm not sure exactly which butterfly this is. Maybe somebody in the comment section can uh, let us know what that is. But the butterflies, look at that. They've got a long mouth part that they go down these tubular flowers. They're just fascinating to watch. Now, I cheated a little bit here. This was actually taken in my yard. This is butterfly weed, but as I mentioned, it's related to the milkweed. Let's move on to wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa is the Latin name here. Those flowers are kind of a lavender pink and there's a mint odor with the Monarda. It is in the mint family. Now this blooms July through August. It can range anywhere between two and four feet, but it does spread by a rhizome, an underground stem. So you have to be careful if you plant this in your yard. It can spread out and cover quite a territory. Some other common names here, bee balm and horse mint. Uh, bumblebees are really, really attracted to this plant. One of the things I learned that, uh, boy, Menard has got a lot of medicinal uses to it, and you can certainly research that and find out. And one thing, too, the Earl Grey tea, which has bergamot flavoring in it, that's actually not used by this type of Menard. That's a citrus plant, and they use the orange peel. So we're not getting our Earl Grey teas we're familiar with with this Menard. Look at that close-up of that flower on the left. Isn't that something? And we've also got a little video here we can look at with that bumblebee in action. They just love this plant. Look at how it flitters around. The bees have air sacs in them, which make them float like that. And there it buzzes off for us. Silverleaf scurf pea, Pedialmelum argophyllum. Now this is a legume, and we're going to cover 
a little bit of information on the legumes here. But first, let's look at that flower. Nice little blue. That silver sticks out in the prairie when I was walking. You walk right up to it. You can spot it from quite a ways away. It blooms a long bloom period, June through September. A range of about one to two feet. It's also called silver leaf Indian bread root. And I found out researching this that the root of this plant was actually used for making flour. Now, as I mentioned, this is in the legume family and legumes are capable of fixing their own nitrogen. So I thought we'd take a quick look at what nitrogen fixation is. Real quick, it's a symbiotic relationship or a relationship where they benefit each other, the bacteria and the plant. And what happens is this bacteria invade the root hairs of the host plant, so they stimulate the formulation of a root nodule or an enlarged cell. And this is where it happens with the bacteria and the plant in a symbiotic relationship, that bacteria is able to take free nitrogen out of the air and convert it into ammonia, which is a form of nitrogen that a plant can take up. So legumes are kind of self-sufficient in that way. We don't have to add extra nitrogen to the soil. We'll move on to purple coneflower, Echinacea angustifolia. This is a pretty prairie plant also. Purplish to white is the most common in the prairie, you know, anywhere between 12 and 24 inches, blooms June through August. Black Samson's another common name. This has got one of the widest ranges of medicinal uses. So if you like that homeopathic type thing, make teas, different things, you definitely want to look up echinaceas. Um, and I would definitely go towards the native or the wild echinaceas if you can. I think they're just going to have more benefits. Off to the left there, that photo, you can see there's some echinaceas. They're improved varieties or the cultivated varieties that we talked about. Look at that, yellows. You got some of the oranges reds. So coneflowers are a real popular cultivated plant, no doubt about it. Up on the upper right there, you can see the bees are drawn to them. And I would definitely recommend leaving coneflower uh, the tops on in the fall through the winter. The birds absolutely love that seed. The lower right there, we've got another cultivated coneflower, just a little bit showier flower than we saw on that first prairie or wild coneflower that we saw. The purpurea species is the echinacea where you see most of the improved varieties, not the angustifolia or wild species. Goldenrod, the solidago species, there's over 140 varieties of goldenrod. And researching this, I was actually quite surprised how beneficial and nutritious this plant is. It blooms July through September with those yellow spikes that you see there, anywhere between 12 and 24 inches. I have seen it a little bit taller than that, but those tiny yellow flowers can be actually used as an edible garnish on salads, and I never knew it. So this is interesting for me to find out some of this information. The flowers and leaves can be used to make tea. You can actually cook the leaves like spinach, uh, add it to soups and stews. You can even blanch the leaves, and that's just a uh, boiling process where you immediately get it cold, and then you can put it in the freezer and keep it long-term for that. I also came across some information with goldenrod that it's not as much of an allergen as we're led to believe. Now, different resources, I, I think, are going to compete in the opinion on that, but I found that interesting as well. Purple prairie clover, Dahlia purpurea. It's got a purple little flower there with those little yellow tips. Look at that. It's just an absolutely beautiful plant. And this one I cheated a little bit. I found this actually on our state capitol grounds planted in one of their beds where they are trying to introduce native flowers, which is really cool. So this purple prairie clover is also a legume, and it's very common in the prairie restoration. It's quite drought tolerant, can be anywhere between one and three feet, but really, really just a very showy plant. You know, why do we use Latin plant names? And uh, I've been kind of reading them off, but the reason being years ago, or centuries ago, actually, Linnaeus, a Swedish naturalist, he developed a nomenclature system so scientists around the world would know that they were talking about the same plant. One plant can actually have 15, 20, maybe even 30 common names. So by narrowing it down with scientists all agreeing that let's use just one language, the Latin language. The Latin language is also very descriptive. So if you've got a plant that, say, has pseudo in the name, that means something of that plant is false. An example here would be Douglas fir. We can't grow fir trees in our area because our pH in the soil is too high, but the Douglas fir then is a false fir. And my favorite Latin name there, Pseudosuga menziesii. Yep, yep, real, real Latin name there. So anyway, Latin plant names, it's very important. I also wanted to mention Hortus third. It's a massive book, 
And just for the North America region, we've got Hortus third covering over 20,000 species. So this is kind of considered the Bible of plant names. You know, I don't use it very often, even though we have dictionaries in our house. We tend to use the internet now for information, but this is just kind of a nice copy to have. I lucked out at a book sale at the University of Minnesota Arboretum where you could put as many books as you can in these uh, recyclable bags and for five bucks I've got a edition of Hortus III that can run anywhere between a hundred and five hundred dollars for a copy so it's just nice to have on the bookshelf. Now keep in mind that's a book that's just North America and it really humbles you to know how much information has been collected over the years by scientists in the plant world. It's just unbelievable. We'll move on to the prairie sunflower, Helianthus petiolaris. Now this has got a common little yellow flower. Looks like the Rudbeckia, blooms June through September, one to four feet. Um, it's also called plain sunflower. And uh, researching this, boy, there's just not a whole lot of interest in it. There wasn't there wasn't all the medicinal type properties or much interesting things about the plant. So I've, I've listed this as the most boring flower covered today. Let's move on to something that is a little bit more interesting though, prickly pear cactus. Yeah, a cactus growing up in the northern Great Plains. This will survive 30 below, probably even 40 below. And it's kind of naturalized itself on in the western prairies of our state, which is a very rocky, gravelly soil. But this only gets about six to eight inches tall. It's got a really neat little yellow bloom when it opens up. And I didn't get a photo, but uh, it draws in different pollinators uh, throughout the season. And there's one little bee that shows up every year. It's about the size of a pinky fingernail. And uh, so very interesting how as that flower opens and changes colors, it will draw different pollinators. And since we're talking about out in the wild, I live mostly in a prairie state. I wanted to cover at least one or two grasses real quickly, even though flowers tend to be more interesting. The smooth brome grass, Bromus Inermis. This is an introduced grass from Hungary, uh, but it's naturalized itself very well around here. It's got a really, really dense sod or root system, very difficult to dig up, so it's very drought tolerant, can take care of itself. You know, what would a prairie be without the grasses? They provide that covering, and then you've got the flowers that can introduce themselves within that sod covering. And let's take a quick look at just how that beautiful that is, how that Grass kind of flows in the wind. Here's a close-up again of the seed head in the fall. Here we've got a, a crested wheatgrass is another interesting prairie grass. We're not going to talk much about this one. And I also wanted to quick show you another video taken at the University of Minnesota Arboretum. They've got a beautiful collection of grasses there if you're ever there. And I, I think this is a miscanthus grass. Look at that thing flow in the wind. Those things are pushing eight to 10 feet tall for crying out loud. Just a beautiful area. All right, so that wraps up about 10 of our first plants we're hoping to cover this year as we explore the prairies in the wild. Make sure you get outside, take walks, go for a bike ride, and uh, be curious about the plants. Close your eyes, take some deep breaths. You'll never regret it. It's just something different about getting out in nature, exploring and finding those plants. I appreciate you watching this garden hike. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again next video.